All right. All right, we are live. Yay. Way to go, Bernard. Way to mess it up. <laughs> it is Tuesday night at seven o'clock. And guys, as we do every week, we bring to you a unique conversation with Commodores. And we have got such a talented guy. He's become a friend of mine of late. He was on some great teams and he is still making a positive impact. He is with the National Commodore Club. And we're going to get to all of that. And of course, I've got Javon Marshall as my guest. How are you tonight, bud? And thank you, Bernard. I appreciate that. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I can't complain. I'm joining you from Dallas and I'm excited to be here. Well, I am so, so happy that you're had some time. I know they've got you ripping and running all the time, but uh, thank you for making some time. And speaking of time, I enjoyed our time this past weekend. Other than the score, I enjoyed the camaraderie and, and hanging with the, the guys from the uh, bowl team from 2013, yeah. a team that was honored. Uh, such a memorable game that was played in Birmingham. We had a whole bunch of us in the stands that proud day. And then yeah. uh, that, uh, the tailgate was great. Every, everything was great even though that you just got to figure out where you're going and with all that construction. But uh, anyway, there y'all are, y'all are figuring it out. Let's put it that way. And before we get into to Javon's journey and, and story, I want to remind you guys that if you still want to go to games this year, I put all the contact information on who to contact, how to get in touch with them. You can't wait until the Tuesday, Wednesday of the week of the game, particularly if it's an away game. But make your plans as quick as you can. They've got those tickets for the Black and Gold Club members. I think you get one or two free tickets to a game. Anyway, they'll work with you, Dallas, or any of those people in the ticket office. And uh, just keep coming back every Tuesday night. I've got Commodores lined up from now until mid-January. So we got some we got some good folks coming up. But Dayton, Ohio, how did you yep. how to Dayton, Ohio, and make your way to Nashville? Share that journey. Oh. Oh man, that's a that's, that's a, a long big, story. Big Ten country. How'd they let you get out of there? I mean, uh, I asked that question after I left, but it really came down to uh characteristics that I couldn't control when it came to my height. That was a big one. Uh came out of a prominent high school, um, moved out outside of the city to a place called Huber Heights, Ohio, when I was in the eighth grade, um, just to get a a better opportunity, uh a better um education but also get an opportunity from an athletic standpoint and i played for wayne high school which uh we had a, a lot of talent come out of there um well known right now marcus freeman the head coach for notre dame he came out of there will allen was a safety that came out of there um mike mickens who i believe is the corner coach there at notre dame was all american out of cincinnati so really a, a good pedigree of individuals that came out of this high school and um, I had came up and um, th going through the recruiting process, it was, you know, Michigan State, a lot of the big East schools um, at that time, a lot of the Mac schools were all interested. I had real great, great, uh, great grades at that time. My dad was a stickler on that. Um, but I, I, I excelled athletically on the field. And of course, coming from Ohio, uh, a lot of individuals want to go to Ohio State. That's where a lot of um a lot of my, my my colleagues and my friends had ended up getting opportunity to go to uh, from Donnie Evich. And we had a young young quarterback on our team that was two years younger than me by the name of Braxton Miller that was uh, beginning a hurricane of, uh, you know, me, uh, attention in news outlets was going to Ohio State. So that was always an option. And um, to be honest with you, Bernard, um, Ohio State ended up offering another safety in my class that I knew who I played a football with by the name of C.J. Barnett, who was a great athlete. He was about 6'1", 6'2", long range guy, played corner, ended up playing safety for him. And uh, at that time, before you had huddle or handlers or all these different individuals that act as middlemen between high school athletes and colleges, there was an individual that was helping us. And he was like, hey, we're we're going, uh, we're going down to Tennessee, Nashville. And he was like, I'm going to TSU and Vanderbilt. And uh, I, I want to be able to take your DVD at that time. So uh, we ended up handing him my DVD. Um, he got back with us probably like three weeks later. He was like, listen, I got good news and I got bad news. He was like, uh, Tennessee State University uh, said, uh, said, no, you were a little short. 
uh, but Vanderbilt was interested. And like most individuals, I was like, Vanderbilt, okay, where where's that at? I had to look at where it was at. Um, my dad knew of the academic pedigree, and he was like, no, nah, you need to take this in consideration. And uh, when I met with uh, Jamie Bryant and Bobby Johnson, of course, I was wearing Timberlands to give me a couple more inches. And uh, I met with them and everything went well from that standpoint. And I, I knew about the SEC because of Florida. And I was like, hey, I'm going to get the opportunity to compete against Florida. And my dad was like, you're going to get the opportunity to compete academically. Um, hey, it's a perfect it's a perfect match. And when we went down there, <laughs> I tell you this funny story. So Northwestern, I was getting recruited by Northwestern too. And uh, I went there, official visits in January. It was freezing. I mean, the wind was blowing, cutting my face. It was freezing. And I got on a plane and I went to Nashville and it was just, it was a tad bit warmer. And I was like, yeah, this is where I'm coming. I'm coming down south. So I was the first individual out of my high school to come to SEC and play uh, football here at Vanderbilt. Oh, that's, oh, Javon, so much to unpack there. But I got to start with, for you younger guys, do you know what a DVD is? <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were probably one of the last classes on the cusp of having to put together your own game tapes and, and to send them around, that's for sure. Um, but that's that's funny. You talked about Timberlands. When I went on my recruiting visit, I wore penny loafers. And we put we put lifts in them, so it made me six feet tall. There you go. <laughs> I, wore, I wore dark pants the whole weekend, so it blended in with the with the lift. Absolutely. <laughs> Our dads probably thought alike on, on that regard. Had you ever been in the South at all? Have you ever visited Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, anywhere in the South before your official visit your senior year? Actually, I have. So um, my mother's family was from a little small town, a county called Sunflower, Mississippi, and my dad, my father is actually from Selma, Alabama. So as a younger, as a younger guy, you could say Alabama adopted me. As a younger guy, I would go down to Selma and we would visit family, um, got to meet his mother. So I was familiar with the South, uh, was raised pretty Southern in, um, in the Midwest in Ohio. So that transition wasn't, wasn't too big for me at all. What about Javon, if I, I assume, with all your visits to Mississippi and Alabama, your your family, maybe the, the elders in your family probably educated you a little bit on Southern history, cultural history. Yeah. Did that play into any uh, concerns for you coming to Nashville? Of course, when you're coming out of Ohio, um, I think at the time when I was on the team and then Carrie, Carrie Spear joined me after that coming from Cleveland, I think we might have been the only two Ohio people Maybe there was another individual. It was a couple of individuals. So it was about four or five of us. Of course, you you hear about stereotypes coming out of Ohio and you're coming into the South. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, that that fear, that initial fear creeps in your mind, right? But um, growing up with a father like I had very early on in my life, um, he put different books, uh, historical books in front of me. I was always educated on um, basically the, the cultural differences in the South, in the Midwest, in the West. And so it was a it was a time for me to uh, uh, learn different culture. And um, like some of those stories you hear growing up from the older generation, um, you was able you were able to see it and you were able to touch it. And it kind of gave me a new uh, respect for um, some of the sacrifices those older generations made in order um, in order for my family to have a better life. I know my family, my mother's family came from Mississippi, um, which at a, at a time in the uh, 50s and 60s, when you talk about lynching, uh, had more lynchings than any other state in the South. And one of the reasons they came to Ohio was because of that. So um, my, my roots and my upbringing had a strong tie to, to the South and being able to experience and being down there, um, it just gave it more meaning. What about two other uh, things you had to uh, adjust to? Humidity and the speed in the SEC. <laughs> which, was, which was harder to adjust to? By far the humidity. <laughs> that first year in camp, that first year in camp, I could not breathe. I was. You really uh, couldn't catch your breath. You probably just, you were <laughs> sucking air the whole time. And you're the like, time. man, I know I'm in good shape, but this is no joke. Oh man, I, I when I tell you I over prepared, I was like, I'm getting ready for camp. I'm running conditioning tests, but the difference is you're running it 
in a, a Midwest summer. And the Midwest summer is totally different from the South. Nashville in the summer, the humidity was insane. And uh, I remember J Jamie Bryan probably looking at me like, this guy is out of shape. But um, it was an adjustment period, right? Um, uh, and I think you know, to, to your second point, when you talk about the speed of the game, um, you know, the, the, the speed is different. The, the fan bases are different. It's the SEC. Um, you know, I work with an individual by the name of Mark Carter. He's always talking about big boy baseball as he coached the NOLA boys in the uh, Little League World Series. But this is big boy football when you talk about the SEC. It's the closest thing to the AFC and the NFC you get. And um, even from the crowd, the, the, crowds, are, the crowds are different. Um, it's just – it's a place you want to be when, when you talk about playing football, it's a place you want to be. It's a place you want to experience. And it, and I think the tag, the SEC tag, it just means more fits the, the conference very well. It's a lifestyle. It, 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 it is it's seven days a week, but Javon, you came to campus, you caught a wave. You were there at the, probably the most productive from a win standpoint in the last 75 to 80 years from a four to five year standpoint. Who was your head coach your freshman fall? So my freshman fall, it was uh, Bobby Johnson. He had recruited me, him and Jamie Bryant had recruited me. Um, they had just came off the 2008 season mm -hmm. and um, they had went six and zero in the beginning of the, the year. They were ranked, they had beat Auburn at home and that was the year I got recruited. It was a lot of excitement. It was, uh, you know, it it, it kind of, it was a electric in Nashville during that season. And um, as you know, we came in 2009 and 2000, 2010 season, um, we went two and 10 twice. And after that 2008 season, we were able to recruit some two great recruiting classes. Um, my recruiting class that incorporated Eric Samuels, um, um, oh, wow, my mind just blank. Wesley Johnson, Wesley Tate, uh, Walker May. We had a, a lot of great guys, and hopefully some of these guys don't, don't kill me for, for forgetting everybody was in the class. Um, but we, we had a great class in 09 and then 010. We came back and we had individuals like Jordan Matthew, Andre Howe. Um, Kenny Ladler was part of that. He was a tweener. He came in early. So we had two great, great recruiting classes under uh, uh, the administration with Bobby Johnson. Well, I was going to say, you get Bobby Johnson for the 09 season, then you get Coach Caldwell for the 2010 season, and then everything changes in 2011 with, with the showing up of, of James Franklin. And you go from a two-win season to a six-win mm -hmm. season to back-to-back nine-win seasons. Yep. And it, it's hard enough to be recruited by one staff. Then that staff leaves, including the head coach. But the players, by and large, stay. And you get Coach Caldwell. Yep. Then, but then when Franklin comes in and completely upsets the apple cart, so to speak, how did you ride that transition academically, athletically? How did you deal with not being, this is my term, not being one of Franklin's guys or recruits, I should say, it's a better word. How did you ride that wave? And how did the other guys from your recruiting class, because you didn't have to stick around. Yeah, yeah. Different era back then, but you still could have transferred. Yeah, no, I, you, hit a, you, you hit a good point. I think um, – it was a magnitude of things all equaling out at one time. And I tell people this all the time. We got recruited by Bobby Johnson. That alone with going two and 10 just created a hungry group of guys. So before Franklin stepped foot on campus, um, we were still working out. We were frustrated with where we were as a program individually. I know the coaches that um, ended up exiting during that time, they were frustrated. Uh, about how they left the program, all of them great character guys um, and taught us a lot about football. Um, and then when James Franklin came to campus, you're talking about a, a young, hungry coach, ready to prove himself, highly prepared, highly attention, uh, attention to detail. He gave us um, 
it was just like a perfect meeting. And he gave us some of the, the secrets to success as far as those things I just I just named. Um, positive attitude, great work ethic, competing in, in, in everything you do. And you got to be able to sacrifice for a, a higher cause. And, and that was the team at that standpoint. So those things were drilled into us. And those things I still use to this day. And I think one of the greatest things we did was um, we kept belief. And I talked to a lot of the donors and supporters during that time. It was hard walking around campus, being 20 and twice, wearing Vanderbilt things. Um, but we kept belief that we were here for a purpose. And um, when he came in, we took the most out of every opportunity. So a lot of those young guys got those opportunities when it was a fresh, fresh, clean slate made it extremely hard, found out who wanted to be here and who wanted to wear that star V on their chest and uh, create a story that was going to be memorable. And, and that's what we did. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, Javon, that first meeting or those first days or weeks of Coach Franklin showing up, did he have individual meetings? Did he have, in addition to, I guess, large meetings? But what really more what I'm, I'm wanting to know is, did he say to the players on the team, you can leave if you want, or or, or did he do like Dion and say, y'all got to go? And I'm only going to do a one. What was his approach, I guess, so, about who stayed and who didn't stay on the roster? So I think uh, when he first came in, I'll never forget a meeting. Um, he wrote on the board, uh, Opportunity, it said opportunity, no spaces. It it, uh, it said opportunity is nowhere. And depending on how you read it, it was a great lesson on perspective. It was, you could have read it, opportunity is nowhere or opportunity is now here. And that was his official, me uh, official meeting with us. That was one of our first meetings. Mm -hmm. And um, he addressed us as a team, like, hey, there's going to be spots everywhere and it's going to be up for yours to grab. And the best thing I can um, compare it to is if anybody's watched the Netflix uh, series about the Gator, Florida Gators and how extremely hard it was when Urban first stepped on campus, that's exactly how it was when James Franklin stepped on campus. I'll never forget our first winter workout was uh, in the Vanderbilt's basketball practice gym, mm -hmm. and it was mat drills and he literally made it extremely competitive. He made it extremely hard where you don't have to tell people like some of you have to go. You know, there was a time where you didn't have the transport portal, right? Um, uh, Coach Dion and his staff did a great job of using the tools that were uh, available to him, but that wasn't the time then. So you had to make it extremely hard to see who truly wanted it, who truly wanted to win and who truly believed in um, basically running through a brick wall and those that were left on the team afterwards, you found out was like, hey, this is not for me. And that's fine. Um, but then you find the other individuals that um, rose to the top, you know, the term creme de la creme, the cream always rises to the top. And that that's was the atmosphere at that time. It was uh, either be eight. So I was going to ask you in those first months before y'all ever stepped foot on the field from a spring training or spring practice, and certainly before the fall, do you remember the vibe that you were in the clubhouse and locker room? Do you remember where their player only meetings like this coach is nuts or I like, <laughs> I like what this coach is doing. I I'm getting on board and y'all can get on board. You know, those, how, how was it playing out? those first several weeks and months that y'all were in training? I think the first several months, it was an initial shock at first. Like we were prepared, we believed, but at the same time we were looking at like, who is this young dude full of energy um, who is not only, not only raising the bar from an athletic standpoint, he's like, hey, you better t be 10 minutes to meeting before the meeting starts. You better be 10 minutes before class starts. And it, if you're not sitting up front, you're not paying attention with a notebook out and a pen, and you're not being engaged, there's consequences that come with that. And that's what we used to call breakfast club. And when you see that that guy who's, we woke up early in the morning for, for um, winter workouts and really hey, what I, the term I use is uh, butter out the duck. You can't get butter out of a duck, but he physically got the butter out the duck. 
and <laughs> and yeah, it's a, it's a funny term. Yeah. But and when he physically got the butter out the duck, and we ended up going to class, and he still wanted more, and he's riding around in that golf cart trying to see who's going to class. He's doing the class checks. Mm-hmm. Um, you 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 really were looking. We first started out looking at each other like, what did who did we just sign as a head coach? Well, well, on that note, wasn't that a stark contrast to Bobby Johnson's personality and to, I mean, let's face it, Robbie Caldwell was kind of a lame duck that, that year, a uh, bad pun, but that was just a one year thing. But wasn't his, wasn't Franklin's personality, his whole approach, just dramatically different personality wise and otherwise than the other two coaches you'd already had? Personality wise, I definitely think it was different. The approach, I thought the end results were were the same. I think they really they really did both really cared about the players. But personality wise, you're I mean, Coach Franklin, uh, at that time, what is he, 34, 35 year old guy had full of energy, first head coaching job. Um, um you know, uh, you don't know what you don't know at that time. And he was determined to uh help us find success in any possible way. And I think the, the, the energy deal was the biggest, the biggest difference. You know, at this point, you're in your third, going on your third year, and you're starting to see from those previous two recruiting classes, the athletic talent on those classes was just continuing to get better and better and better. So maybe you being a third year was in the right place at the right time, if you think about the new energy, the new staff, the new infusion of, of athletes, you go to that first game and y'all beat the pants out of uh, Elon. Yeah. Then you beat Connecticut in a close one. Mm-hmm. I think the true big test wasn't until you beat the snot out of Ole Miss. 30 Ole Miss. And yep. for me, when that game, which was played, I think at home, um, just kind of signaled, hey, there may be something here. But then what happened the next three weeks? Lost to South Carolina, didn't even yep. get Bama, and then lost, actually a close loss to Georgia. Georgia, yep. And then you beat Army, yep. lost to Arkansas and Florida, but beat Kentucky, lost to UT in, in overtime. And that's really where mm-hmm. I am is that Tennessee loss in overtime because that mm-hmm. was, it, at least for us, I can't imagine how it was for you. That was a heartbreaker. I mean, it, it really yeah. was. Did you get to, do, do you have memories of that game? Were you playing at that point? What do you recall about that Tennessee game? Bernard, I remember that Tennessee game like it was yesterday. And um, it really stoked a fire for us. It was a close game. There was a couple couple calls that, um, of course, there's calls in every game nobody agrees with, but there was a couple calls we didn't agree with. We were playing them on their home. And I remember um, walking off the field after giving it everything we got, being so close, going into overtime. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember the abrupt ending of it all and watching everybody celebrate. And I kid you not, I kept the scoreboard picture from that game on the back of my computer for that whole year until we played Tennessee again. Well, you know, Javon, y'all, were, y'all had five wins going into that game. I yep. That. What happened the yep. next? Say that one more time. You broke up. What happened the next game? Uh, the next game when we played Tennessee at our house. Um, the, next, the next week, y'all beat the snot out of Wake Forest. Wake Forest. To be yep. bowl eligible. And yep. y'all, y'all took out some frustrations, a 41-7 to seven win over Wake Forest. That had to have been a good feeling after such a bad feeling, you know, the week before. Well, you, you hit it on the nose. We, we, we found out that we needed to handle business, and it was a, a do-or-die situation. And if we wanted to make a bowl game and play in the postseason, this was our opportunity. And uh, you got to remember with all those games is – I remember a lot of those games were close games or one or two mistakes away. We were just at the brink of like turning that, turning that tide. Yeah. And um, we, we knew that 
like we needed our next step as a team was to grow and get to the postseason. Guys, I've got Javon Marshall. Javon was with coaches Johnson, Caldwell, and Franklin. We're now in the 2011 season. And let's talk about you personally at this point. You're in your third school term, third season. Are you academically, are you you, you um, finding your footing? I suspect with your dad's uh, influence and how much important it was, I bet you were. What about from a social standpoint, academic? Take us into your world yeah. that third year. What was going on with you? Man, um, I would say from a third year standpoint, um, I had I had really matured. And so that first the first year on Vandy's campus, I ended up red shirting. I ended up getting a hurt, so I red shirted. So by the time my third year came around, I was a fifth year senior, and most fifth year seniors. You have new um, young guys on the team. Um, they're they're calling they're they're either calling you Unc or uh, OG, and you're the original guy there. So um, I had started to relax at that time. I had met she was my uh, girlfriend at that time, uh, who's now my wife. We've been together for 13 years. I had met her, and we started getting serious. And um, as the later on, as that season went on. I ended up having my first child who was born the week we played Tennessee in the third 2013 year. Oh, wow. So I be, yeah, I became a I became a parent pretty early and had responsibilities pretty early, which pretty much has been my life, um, been mature there. But uh, from a social standpoint, um, I think I only had a few classes left. I, I slowed down. I took some classes that I never was able to uh, kind of explore and do. I was pretty much done with the degree and I was trying to find out what what um, life would be like after college. And so is this what you're describing this time period? Is this the 2013 season or 11? 2013 season. All right, let's let's back up for just a minute. We're going to get to 13. Yes. The 2011, that season where we're the team is, is starting to mature. Yep. From a social standpoint. Did you join a fraternity by this point? Did you have friends outside of football who you hung around with, or did you kind of stay in that yeah. football bubble? So, for the for the most part, we were in the football bubble. Um, we had a, we had a uh, kind of like a, a policy rule or a team rule called training and training on. And me and Jordan and Matthews were laughing was laughing about this last week where um, co coach wanted us focus on football. You know, it was academics and football for us. So when training was on um, social events, we didn't get the opportunity to, to explore all the social events. But um, when, when there was successful times and it was time to, uh, we took care of business from an academic standpoint, from an athletic standpoint, there was times where there were training on, but because uh, training off, I should say, but because there was training on so much, we tended to spend a lot of time together. And I think what that did was made us a lot closer. A lot of teammates that you probably wouldn't dare have a conversation with beforehand or your, your schedules didn't line up for you to meet so much, you spent a lot of time with. So we really became close bonded family. And um, outside of that, we, we, we started working together, um, hung out of, of course with uh, Stephen Clark, uh, Jordan Matthews was always in the building. Me and Kenny were together. We ended up being uh, co-safeties together. So me and Kenny was together. Um, but uh, everybody on the team, pretty much, Walker May, um, Walker May and Wesley Johnson, who I came in with, of course, close buddies of mine. And uh, we, we just really formed as a family. And I, I still hold those relationships close to this day. Well, and I was going to say that 2011 season or school term, we'll say, the school term, that mm -hmm. really laid the foundation for the next two seasons. If you mm -hmm. guys got that close under Coach Franklin's first year, it certainly, from a scoreboard standpoint, paid off the next two years. Did it ever enter your mind, or was there ever conversation, and I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit, yeah. that Coach Franklin was ever going to leave? Did, before all of that went down, did it, did those conversations ever get talked, you know, in a hushed tone or 
did, did it ever percolate as a topic? Yeah. I don't think it percolated as a topic until, like you said, skipping ahead, probably midway in the 2013 season. Like, there's a possibility, like, he's we've changed the culture around here. Um, there's been there's been things from a Vanderbilt football standpoint that we haven't seen since the 70s, um, 80s. Um, and, and we had that success in 2008, but consecutively those three years. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, of course, you have media, more media news outlet. That's the thing with winning, right? Everybody wants to be around. So I've seen a lot of people wear black and gold. I've seen a lot of more media outlets there at Magoogie. Um, you know, we had to be prepared for that and we had to train for that. ESPN was there more. So, um, there, that's when some of the rumors and speculation starts to come out from the outside in. And, but we always felt that like, Hey, if that time came, administration will handle that. Um, we were very process oriented and process driven. We were coached that way. We were taught that way. Um, that was our mindsets at that time was, you know, even from a football standpoint, six seconds at a time, it was one game at a time, one practice at a time. So when those rumors did creep in, we, we focused on one game at a time. You know, Giovanni, you start the 2012 season and not such a good, a good start. If you remember, a loss South Carolina, a loss Northwestern, then you write the ship with Presbyterian with a blowout win, but then you get blown out by Georgia but now things are starting to turn a little bit. Mm -hmm. Guys only lose one more game the rest of the year. Yep. You're right. Again, you beat Missouri. Florida gets by you. But then you have a historic run that's never been done before in one season or maybe not in the last 100 years. You beat Auburn, Kentucky, Mississippi, Tennessee. I guess the 13 season was a little bit more of a, a stretch. But you get to that bowl game and you guys are sitting at eight and four and you're taking on North Carolina State. And of course, you the Music City Bowl, you guys win that. What's the vibe like during that time period on campus? Hadn't won six, seven games in a row in generations. It had yeah. to be from a school spirit standpoint, an all time high for you guys. Oh, and we were we were preparing for it, Bernard. Like, for instance, we uh, I remember all the captains and I, I had been elected captain by my teammates during that time in 2012. All the captains went to all the frat and sorority houses before the season. And we were like and we went with coach and we were like, hey, we want you guys to be there. We want you there screaming. We want you there loud because we're getting ready to do something historic in a sense. We believe first. And as the time went on, you start collecting those wins, like you said, the back end, the back end of the season, we start taking off. And I really can tell you that I remember the way the stadium would look. And it was it was crowded. You you started, you seen after every win, more people will come to the games, more people wore um the black and gold. I've seen a lot of people that wore, hey, I I like Tennessee, but I'm putting on black and gold this weekend. So it was uh, we were we were, you know, splitting the state in that sense. And, um, you, you know, we you certainly did with that 2012 butt kicking. Against <laughs> no question. Biggest victories against the Orange in probably 50 years. Well, you remember the, two, the 2011 we were talking about that mm -hmm. was. That was on that computer screen that whole time. And I know a lot of my teammates felt the same way. And we felt that um, we had grown. Um, we had grown from a competitive standpoint. We had grown to knowing what it took to win in the SEC. And uh, they were coming into our house this that, that year. And it was important that we, uh, we made a statement. Is that the Derek Dooley game and he's on a crutch and – Darius Sims takes a ball or two back to the house. Is that that game? Yeah. yeah Darius Sims uh, takes a ball back. Andre Howe has two interceptions. Uh, there's, a, there's a fantastic <laughs> photo of Dooley on the sidelines with this, uh, you know, that look. And Sims, I guess it was, was flying right by him down the sidelines. Yep. And they had, 
they had talent that year. A lot of those guys are still, um, like a lot of our guys, are still playing. Um, and Cordell Patterson and Bray was a quarterback guy with a big arm. Um, mm-hmm. They had talent, but Justin Hunter, I believe, was a wide receiver. So on the back end, we took it as a challenge as DBs, and we wanted to make a statement, and, and we did. We, we applied pressure the whole game. Speaking of pressure, you're in your fourth academic year at this point. Yep. How did you keep the academic pressure on? Because it would be very easy, I assume, that you're in the midst of a big win streak, six, seven games in a row. I'm a little tired. Or I may need to watch a little bit more Sports Center. How, how did you keep that focus? How did Coach Franklin keep that focus for you guys academically? Structure, structure, structure. So discipline, structure, consistency, though. You hear those terms all the time, but they really meant something in our program at that time. So, um, like I like I talked about earlier, the class checks got stronger. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. A lot of people don't know. Even from when training was off, and we could we could go out and enjoy each other um, at a college party every now and then. There were individual people that were working for coach that making sure we were doing everything we needed to do. Uh, from that standpoint, um, undercover. He talked, undercover. Yeah, yeah, undercover. We had undercover people. Um, mm-hmm. I think from I think from a, um, a maturity standpoint, we had conversations about uh, we had different conversations about how to approach different situations that young men approach in college and how to handle those correctly. Um, so we we had those conversations. So it, it was preparation from that standpoint. Um, and then and then uh, the structure of just knowing at that point I was sharing I was sharing me and Trey Wilson who play I play corner with at that time we had this deal where we would uh, we would do if we had like a 30 page paper we would start a whole month early and we would do one page a night because I had a rule by 12 o'clock hit I was going to sleep I knew we had, the strength training program practice it was so demanding that you needed that that physical time to recruit, re, regroup and um, approach the day with a fresh mindset. So I was going to sleep by 12. So I would start a month early, just take a page at a time and creating that structure and that consistency. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, man, I had 10 more pages to go. And I was like, I got one page and I'm done. And um, those those types of seekers we passed along and, uh, you know, McGugan provided tutors um they provided all the resources we needed to be successful from an academic standpoint so there was no reason to fail at Vanderbilt um no reason at all and it's still the same way to this day so that's how we stayed locked in and and was able to be successful are you still writing that one page a day and going to bed at noon you still that <laughs> I, I try to as much as possible the doctoral program is a lot more reading so uh, it's trying to trying to keep up with as much as reading as i can well, i don't know why i said noon i meant midnight but i don't know if you guys are aware we've got a doctoral student right here with javon marshall he's going to be a phd before it's too long <laughs> guys were running through javon's story and it's just so fascinating that time period of 09 to 13 time period when he's on campus and and i don't want to rush through that last season but by this point you you have a family and are you yep. living in married student housing or where where are you at this point on campus or off campus so at that point it was later on um in the season that year uh when i had my son but i I was definitely getting serious i had gotten engaged and um i was living off campus and um the outside outside suburbs of nashville and Antioch at that time so so uh, i was traveling into school i had i had a car and like I said, my 2013, my schedule was a little bit lighter. So um didn't have to be at 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 school from a class standpoint every day, but uh made sure I was there getting rehab, made sure I was working out and uh handling handling my business from that standpoint. Well, so much so, and I don't want to overlook this. It's a, it's it's an honor to be elected captain one year by your classmate, your teammates. But you had a second year, your fifth year, that 2013. Let's see if you can remember who all the captains are. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay. 
Go. 2013, let's say uh, Kerry Spears, mm-hmm. uh, Jordan Matthews, Wesley Johnson, Walker May, Kenny Ladler, and me. And I need another offensive guy. Uh, Zach Stacey. Mm-mm. Let me, let me no. throw it to you, at least according to what I'm looking at. This is the 2013 team. Austin Carter Samuels. Austin Carter Samuels was. Andrew East. Andrew East Weston. Yep. Wesley Johnson, Javon Marshall, Jordan Matthews, Walker May, and Kerry Spear. Okay. Yep. Yep. I got them mixed up with the 2012. Uh, That's all right. That's all right. 2012 year. All that. But it's just, it's an honor. And, and frankly, and this is meant to be a compliment, that speaks to your character. That speaks to your teammate mentality. That speaks to your dedication. Because you didn't have to stick around for that next season. You were already, you probably could have graduated or been very, very close to graduating. You are, you had a child in a way, a serious relationship. It, it could have been time for you to pivot. What kept yeah. you there for the 13 season? I think what for me was coming into the 13 season was um, we had an opportunity. I truly believe coming off of the 2012 season, we had an opportunity to be even better. Um, those guys that you just named, um, you know, they, they were leaders on the team they, they, having Kenny around Andre Howe, Stephen Clark. Um, we were, we were just at that time. I felt like it was the best time to continue to grow and push this thing to the next level. And it was a lot of excitement around. A lot of people had us, um, I remember reading, I remember reading articles where me and me and Kenny were, you know, if not the top safety duo in the SEC, um, number two. And um, it was just time to take that next step. We had a lot of young talent. Um, you know, Caleb Azubake, I know, had came during that time. I believe Adam Butler had just got on the team. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of talent. And I think we could have did something, we could have did something special. And, and to open that season, you had one of the longest win streaks in the country to open the season. Y'all were sitting at seven games. And yep. I'll never forget that old Miss game. That was a heartbreaker, of course, 39-35 at night on national TV. That's big. And that just was uh, – anyway, it, w- it was what it was. But then you yep. guys took care of business against Austin P, and you just continued down the road. And this is the year that you guys ended up beating Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, all in the same season. I don't know if that's ever been done. But then – you get to the BBVA Compass Bowl against Houston, and that's yep. that's sitting about six miles from my house. And we had yep. a, huge, a huge crew. That was a big game. But what did it mean at the end of the season? You have back to back nine and four, probably hadn't been done in a hundred years. What did that mean to you guys at that time? You're you're celebrating after the game or maybe even the days and weeks afterward as you're reflecting on the season, when did it sink in, I guess, is the best question to ask. When did you realize you had made history? Bernard, to tell you the truth, um, I think it truly sunk in this last past weekend, to be honest with you. We know we did something special. We knew we, um, we, had, created, we had created something that hadn't been done in a long time. And we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, but we knew we had kind of cemented ourselves in history, um, our our piece of history. We contributed to the program in that sense. And this weekend, when they celebrated the 2013 team and seeing everybody and seeing how they progress, and you know now they have families, or you know I got to see I got to see uh, everybody's families and where they're at in life now. We're all spread out into the con- across the country. Mm-hmm. It's truly it truly means something when you know that last game happens. It you know some people didn't put on a helmet after that ever again. Okay. Some people we didn't see each other sometimes until you know until last weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, it was never the same, and it just hit me that we really did something. We did something special, and not only that, how hard it is to do something special. Um, for you guys to come back to celebrate that was very cool. Now, obviously, I didn't know any of you guys till this past weekend. I mean, you and I had met a while. Yep. But not everybody in that crew 
is as good in physical shape as you are. Let's be honest. <laughs> some of those guys are in fantastic shape. Some of those guys are getting to be a little closer <laughs> to their dad bods. But no doubt. It wasn't, but the one thing that was crystal clear was the love in that room when you guys all saw each other and the faces and the grins and the hugs and just falling back into the stories. That was pretty yep. cool from my standpoint, just 10 feet away. And then getting yep. to meet one of those guys was an honor as, as well. So that had to have been a, a good feeling, a good weekend for you guys, for that team. No question. And I think uh, to add on to what you said, it means something when you when you sacrifice that much, the blood, sweat, and tears, those experiences you share with people, that's, that, you know, that's what, that's what matters. Like I, we bring up these games, we got great memories of these games, but I tell you, if I could go back into that locker room and uh, set up two helmets and have a tennis ball and just, just have jokes with some of those, those, uh, those guys and, or lay out on the carpet after a hard workout where you can't even move. And you, you talk about how hard it was or how somebody almost quit. If you could get back those moments, those are the moments you remember forever. And those are the stories that you talk about. And, and, and that's what's special. Isn't that the beauty of team sports? Beauty of it. Isn't that the beauty of taking you back to a much more, I guess, innocent time of our lives where you don't have mortgages and all that stuff that <laughs> you not quite yet. You're on the cusp, but you're not quite fully there. You're in the bubble of that football world. but. I've always held that the most important thing about playing team sports, regardless of what level you achieved or stopped playing, is the fact that you had you went through similar shared experiences with your brothers. With yep. your, now, they weren't all your closest buds, but I guarantee you, just like this past weekend, you saw guys you were extremely close with then and still. And then mm -hmm. you saw guys on the team that you guys just knew y'all were on the team together. Y'all were teammates. You didn't necessarily share each other's lives and jokes and things, but your teammates. And that always no question. that time and place that makes it so special. No question. Now, I want to pivot a little bit because you have not, yep. you, you have had such a positive impact on Vanderbilt sports back in the day. You had a stint as a coach for Vanderbilt, and now yep. you're an employee of the National Commodore Club. And I kind of want to talk, I don't want to quickly go through that, but we've got about 10 minutes left in our talk. What brought you back to campus or to continue to be on campus as a coach for a while? And then how did you end up coming back and now in your position with the NCC? Wow, that's a great question. So uh, after I got done playing, I, I had a, a small free agent opportunity with the Atlanta Falcons. Um, if you remember, I dealt with shoulder injuries a lot during my playing time and uh, just body couldn't hold up it, it is, it is as bad as I wanted it to, to hold up. It just couldn't hold up. And at that at that time, I had made the decision to uh, make a commitment to my fiance, now my wife and my son, um, you know, to make sure they were good. Make sure they were provided for. That's the, the decision you make when you when you choose to have children is uh, to give them a better life. So I was always told when you find out something you love more than football, that's when you know to put it down. And that's when I put it down because I found out that I, I love my son and my family a lot more. And I was glad, I was, you know, it's, it's funny how life works out because I, if it wasn't for me having my son at that time, um, I love football so much, I probably would have been on the couch still, right? I, I just love football. I, I didn't go home during the summer. I was always there working out. Like I was that that type of student athlete. And um, I had my son, so I knew I had to get up off the couch. And I spent a lot of time at Vanderbilt, even after I got done, just seeing what was going on. I was always fearful of coaching. And um, why, why I was fearful. You, why were you fearful of coaching? Because I seen the time commitment that uh, those guys put in. And I was really seven days a week, 18 hour days. And I wanted to be a, a staple. I wanted to be someone my son knew um, during his life growing up. And I, I, at that age, I quite didn't figure out that balance yet. And there's some coaches that do it very well. But at that age, I didn't figure it out. But I was I walk around with my son 
all the time. And, um, hey, you know, Derek Mason was the coach at that time. And he, he seen me, he pulled me over. He was like, hey, man, I see you. You're, 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 you're giving good advice. Um, you're giving good game to a lot of our, our players now. Have you ever thought about coaching? And I was like, ah, I don't know. I had thought about it, but like I said, I was fearful. And uh, he said, why don't you come try it out? So I had tried it out. I did it for, uh, as most people do, did it for free for about six months. So that I wanted to be around. I was balancing a job and coaching on the side, uh, just trying to make it work. And uh, he was like, man, I got a GA opportunity that came up. And, and you're the first person, first person that came to mind. You can get your master's um while you uh while you coach and initial my initial thoughts was you know like hey I enjoyed it this far let's just dive right on in let's take let's let's take a shot let's lean into that fear and find out how what's it like and um I did and it was a transformative time that that first year we went to a ball game went to Shreveport and I got to coach with some of my former teammates like uh Chris Marr um got to meet other coaches that became like family that I'm still close with to this day. And, um, um, and it was, is transformative from a work ethic standpoint. If you want to know old school work ethic, you sit in the building and you're, you, you want to say, you want to give your input, but uh, it's very old school. You, you're quiet. And, you know, you had coaches that look at you and tell you, you know, um, I've forgotten more football than what you know. And it was very humbling. It was very humbling. And you, you start to understand that, um, you know, in, in anything you do, you have to put your heart and your soul into it. And you got to let things be what they may. And you got to follow that passion because that's how your kids find out what their passion is and how they're supposed to chase it. Mm -hmm. So um, I did that for, for three years. But even while I did that, I, I saw different things within the, the process that I didn't I didn't necessarily me myself. I didn't necessarily like, and I wanted to change. And um, that's what kind of led me into uh, administration. I seen, I said, who makes those decisions? Um, and, and how can I help this process for somebody else that comes through this coaching process? And that kind of led me to my pathway to wanting, wanting to work in administration and continue to build and, and, and delve in to, in that side. And then that led you eventually to the NCC. How yep. Long did you take on that job? And, <laughs> and let's let we let's talk about it a little bit. Yeah. So um, when I got done with coaching, I, I took advice from Vice Chancellor, three people: Vice Chancellor Williams um, at that time, uh, Candice at that time, who was the deputy, and Derek Gregg, who we talked about earlier, and. They all looked at me. They were like, hey, you're coming into um, administration. You want to be able to get some experience that I, I don't think at that they necessarily got during their their tutelage and as they grew. And they was like, you want to be in you want to be able to get into uh, development and see that the business side of um, higher education. Also, as a student athlete and, and as a coach, you've seen the internal working models of it all. But you want to be able to see the development side. So. Um, I started looking for development jobs. I, I talked to Mark at that time. And at that time, Vanderbilt was going through a lot of changes, a lot of changes. And Mark would say, hey, I wish I could take you on, but I can't right now. And, um, you know, I knew I wanted to do it, but the closest gig I could get to it was probably in corporate sales and marketing. So I was uh, worked as a uh, sales and marketing manager for Fiat Chrysler Automobiles and now Stellantis. And it was, I probably wasn't prepared for it, but it was the best three and a half, four years that you can have from a business standpoint. And it slingshotted me into how I see um, not only business, but um, how, how I uh, see higher education now. And that moved me from Nashville to Scottsdale, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona to Eugene, Oregon, Eugene to Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City, back to Corvallis. Um, Oregon, where I got when I got the opportunity to work for Oregon State in the same capacity I'm working now. Oregon State was great, and unfortunately, we had a a, a family incident that happened, and we were in Tennessee. And I, I looked at my wife and I said, uh, "There's an opening at Vanderbilt," and it was just perfect timing. I kid you not. And I talked to Mark, I talked to Candace and Angie Bailey, 
And uh, they said, hey, we would love to have you back. And I think they were looking for a former student athlete that um, had some administration experience and it was a perfect marriage. And uh, I came back home and I seen what they were doing with Vandy United and the campaign. And I got extremely excited. It's not too often that an individual can say, hey, I want to sit in uh, the athletic director chair one day, but I got to work on a $350 million campaign that's going to be transformative on a university setting and something that hasn't been done at Vanderbilt in, I mean, 20, 25 years ever, (laughs) right? (laughs) So um, I saw it as a great opportunity and I'm appreciative to Mark, I'm appreciative to Candace. And most of all, I'm appreciative to our team members there at the NCC for welcoming and welcoming me in and uh, treat me as a family member as we continue to build this thing out. Well, from an energy standpoint, I know you bring that that mindset that they are so appreciate appreciate. And I know you're ripping and running all the time. So we're going to get you out of here in just a minute or two. Uh, I know you're, you're out of town right now. But Javon, what is it about the NCC? the national Commodore code that gets you fired up these days. I think it, I think it's the the fan base, the alumni and the donors. When you talk about philanthropy, mostly in athletics at other institutions within the SEC, there, there's this, um, it, it's becomes, it's grown so much. It becomes transactional. And here at Vanderbilt, you still have that true tie to philanthropy. You still have the supporters that, truly want to give back to see the student athlete win. Um, A lot of today's talks in college athletics um, is, uh, you know, surrounding around uh, NIL and transfer portal is a lot of times it's about the 2%, right? What about the 98% that don't have the opportunity to go on to play professionally? What happens to them? And that's what Vanderbilt represents. It uh, represents that 98% that can go on and be successful after life. And I think our supporters and our, our alumni understand that. And, when you know, our relationships with the NCC, as they continue to grow, I, I think you see that. It's philanthropy and engagement from uh, a true personal level and people that truly authentically care. Vanderbilt is not like any other institution in the SEC. It, it competes in the SEC. It competes academically. And we're going to compete there at a high level. But it's also small enough that it's family oriented. You know, when you can go to an event and you can see a guy that, that's that been supporting Vanderbilt baseball for 20 years, you, sometimes you don't get that at other institutions. And and, and, and and I think that's unique about Vanderbilt and it's something that I'm extremely excited to be a part of. Two-time captain, member of two bowl teams, now still helping Vanderbilt, National Commodore. Yeah. Yvonne, thank you for sharing your journey. It's been enlightening tonight. I really appreciate your time and, and your candidness. Uh, thank you, Bernard, for having me. Um, I always always appreciate, appreciate platforms like this. We have some very intriguing individuals um, here that came through Vanderbilt, that's here at Vanderbilt. And I just ask anybody that's watching this, continue to support us and continue to believe because when those two and two, 10 seasons that we had in 2009, 2010, we continue to believe and look what came after that. So continue to believe and we appreciate your support. Keep saying it. Keep doing what you're doing, Javon. Anchor down. Anchor down. Thanks for having me.